Um, Rosina and Charlotte, can we start by you telling us, I know many of you in the room will, be, will, will know them, but could you tell us a little bit about yourselves, what you're up to, your, your thing? Tell us the, tell the room. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rosina Bierbaum. I'm a professor of public policy at the University of Maryland and a professor of natural resources at the University of Michigan. Um, I've spent most of my adult life working on adaptation to climate change issues, so I suspect I'm the odd person in the audience who's actually an ecologist by training. Um, but I also chair the science and technical panel of the Global Environment Facility, so I'm spending a lot of time thinking about that 70% of the world that has to be brought up to a better standard of living. Brilliant. And you wrote the World Bank's World Development Report on Climate that really set the stage. <laughs> in 2008, yes. It was, they needed to import a scientist to help write the first report on climate change and development at the World Bank. Brilliant. Charlotte. Well, thank you, Leo. It's a great privilege to be here, and thank you for the invitation to Trondheim. So my day job is actually at Statoil. I head up a small team on strategy and policy in our sustainability function. But here today on this panel, I'm actually representing the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. And this is a very, very exciting development. Right now, there's no rest for the wicked. We've heard both from Jay and also from the State Secretary. Uh, we have NDCs, it's time for urgent action. And the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative is all about that. Under the leadership of 10 very enlightened CEOs, including oil and gas producers from China, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, Spain, uh, India, and a number of European companies, including Statoil and also Total that is here in the audience, um, really driving this change and galvanizing action on climate change. And that's what I'm representing here today uh, as a response to how is the NDCs going to affect uh, the industry and how can industry also uh, affect the NDCs. Fantastic. And you're also multi-talented, yes? You have a background in music as well? Well, I'm no musician, but I used to work in the music industry. That's right. That's my claim to fame from a long, long time ago. Is it true you went on tour with Justin Timberlake? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So look, we've got a multi-talented panel here. Um, wow. Can I just ask you all to start with a really hard question, okay? <laughs> if you just boil it all down, and you want a 1.5 degree warming and no more by 2050, just one thing, give us one sentence on what is the one most important thing that needs to be done. Jay, starting with you. Emissions have to begin to decline at a global scale immediately. But specifically, so who needs to do what? Every, the total <laughs> no, planet, in, in total, everyone added together, emissions have to begin to decline immediately. They have to be at zero by the middle of the century. Okay, obviously, run the maths, the emissions have got to go down, so people have got collectively to reduce the emissions, but what's the one thing that one group has got to do? <laughs> well, what comes out of the Paris Agreement is not a one-size-fits-all. That's actually what was tried in Kyoto. But rather, the NDC approach is that every country develops its own way of reducing its emissions. And that's actually one, uh, one of the features that makes it more likely to succeed, but also makes it harder for someone to answer your question. What's the one thing that everybody has to do okay, so what other is than it? reduce their emissions immediately? So what is it? <laughs> <laughs> is it China? Is it India? <laughs> Everyone. It's all Everywhere. It's, it's Norway? Everywhere. Norway's going to be Europe collectively 0.1 degree mm -hmm. difference, no matter what we do here. So who really is going to move the needle? If you've got to choose one agent, one agent, the market. <laughs> Which means a price of carbon? It means a combination. It no combination. Price of no carbon. combinations allowed here. All right. <laughs> is it the market? Then what is it in the market? Ultimately, you have to have a business model that makes it possible for companies to continue to make profits and reduce their emissions simultaneously and indefinitely into the future. So it's the price of carbon or not? It could be. <laughs> Guys, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I heard the market, I heard price of carbon. 
for you. <laughs> what Thank you, you Jay. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah. I know your colleagues, so please can you... Once you have that... <laughs> okay. No, I think we need to really change people's hearts and minds so that we're protecting the students, children, and the next generation, and we're all at one ton of CO2 per person by 2050. And if you make that your goal, you can figure out how to do it. So it's the consumer. It's us. It's the consumer. Charlotte, for you. Well, we have this insurmountable task we might feel ahead of us. We heard it from Paris, you know, it's this big, big stuff that has to happen right now. So, so let's just do it. And I think this is what's so excited about the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. It's like, let's just go and do it. And right now it's about action. Um, by 2020, we should sort of peak our emissions and so on. So in my mind, um, action, um, partnering with the unlikely, this is very much about, again, what the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative is about. And we're going to focus immediately on methane as well as CCS, bringing that to scale. So your answer is it's partnerships at the level of things like the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative that will really move the needle? Yes, and doing things differently. This is unprecedented territory. Never have you seen the oil and gas industry pulling together, led by the CEOs, focusing on a single issue, at, at such scale, interest, speed, um, and now we are looking to partner with a whole host of different entities and governments to really uh, make this happen. And, and uh, based on our analysis, uh, there's two areas where we can really, uh, we can make a big impact right now. One is methane emissions, and the other one is bringing CCS to scale. And is there an investment into renewables as well as part of that? Uh, no, that's not part of the uh, proposition today. So it's really is, but the emissions that you can control um, that's close to our industry or in, within our industry that we want to address first. And what's very exciting about this alliance that we have is that when we invest in new technology, near to market technology, for instance, for methane detection, um, then we can deploy that in our own industry at scale and medium on. Presto. Thank you. State Secretary. Uh, I would say a global price on carbon that is high enough to, to, to lead to immediate actions. Unfortunately, that is not possible. There's not an international agreement about that. <laughs> so since that is not possible, the second best solution is to the countries to deliver even better indices and to start delivering on them from day one. Okay. Um, <laughs> can I ask, can we, can we have the lights up in the room a, a bit? Because um, I know we've got some giant brains on this panel who was asking some terrifying questions before. Um, <laughs> but also, I suspect in this room, there's some pretty big brains as well. Um, will you raise your hand if you are doing energy modeling in the room? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay, so we got quite a few. Um, will you raise your hands if you're doing academic work in the room that's related to energy transition stuff? <laughs> okay, so with the permission of the, of the expert panel, can we, can we also throw this question out to the some of these questions out to the room a bit. All right, brilliant. So, but let's just, you know, let's just start with a few from the panel, expert panel. What do you think of any of this stuff? Over to you. Questions from the panel. Please. And will you call out your name? Sure. Meredith Evans from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Um, I have a question, uh, presumably anyone on the panel, but it, it draws from uh, some of the things that both Jay and Rosina have said, um, noting the important role of bioenergy CCS, but at the same time, the challenges of getting there because of the land use issues, because the business community doesn't see the path forward today. Are there any other alternatives? So Jay, you had mentioned that it's critical in part because of the fact that other, there, there will be some residual emissions that are just difficult to get rid of um, from other sectors. Are there other alternatives for some of those residual emissions? Or are there any other alternatives that we could think of that could potentially shrink the size of the need for bio uh, energy CCS? Thanks. Okay, Jay. Sure. Uh, actually, uh, that's a, a great question, and, and in fact, it, it is possible to get to two degrees if you don't have bioenergy with CO2 capture and storage. And in fact, in one of the slides that I showed, there is this 
parallelism between whether you have CO2 capture and storage and whether you don't. If you don't have CO2 capture and storage, you really don't have bioenergy with CO2 capture and storage. <laughs> so, so if you take CO2 capture and storage out, you're not going to be doing that. Um, and yet, there was a way to two degrees, but that path required negative emissions, and that path required that carbon be removed from the atmosphere net, and not at small scales, but at large scales. And so, without the CO2 capture and storage, models that have land use components to them, really find that, well, one of the least expensive paths forward is to afforest massively. And so you actually put in place large extent of forest. And, and that's another pathway without bioenergy and CO2 capture and storage. And yet, at the same time, it has an enormous footprint on the landscape and therefore fundamentally changes the landscape. And I think that those two paths both have consequences that are non-trivial, and I don't think that's really appreciated. And I really appreciate uh, Meredith for bringing that up because it is an important point. There is a third possibility, and that is probably one that you don't want to rely on, but it you know, exists in principle. And that is you could do free air capture and then just literally remove carbon from the atmosphere and then, of course, store it either in underground CO2 storage or you could potentially weather, you know, to, you know put it into rock. Um, but that's pretty much the extent of possibilities. All those paths, the two degrees, go through one of those three nodes. <laughs> Thank you. Please, we have a question. Oh. Uh, Volker Krei from Yasa. I had a question towards uh, Rosina, and I mean, we, we were discussing um, bioenergy in one of the previous sessions, and uh, the potential adverse effects on um, biodiversity through management of forests or, or massive uh, agricultural production of, uh, of bioenergy. I mean, one of the other possibilities is that we accept um, more temperature change to happen. Um, which also has expected impacts on biodiversity and so on. And so he, I think it would be really handy if you could kind of give a bit of a summary what the state <laughs> of the uh, literature is to, to understand that trade-off maybe a little better. Well, that's a, a great question. And of course, we don't know completely the answer to it. But, but you know, to, to start where Jay ended, um, he, you know, all of those one and a half or two degree scenarios require some miracles to happen. I mean, we don't know how to do CCS. Everything has to happen perfectly if you don't do CCS. And if you're aforesting, was that land you were going to grow crops on? Or was that land you might have grown biofuels on? And so, um, the, the current rates of temperature change that we're experiencing are four to 10 times that which have been seen in the paleo record. So we are already pushing ecosystems at rates beyond what they are accustomed to, at least for the last 10,000 years. So the parts that swim and crawl and are wind dispersed, they're not keeping up. We're seeing asynchronies in birds and prey, etc. cetera. Um, we're seeing red foxes in the Arctic. We're, <laughs> we're seeing snow melt in Yellowstone and weasels that are still in their winter white, uh, completely <laughs> exposed. <laughs> so we are already seeing asynchronies. And so uh, coping with future climate change does depend on damping the rate of change to try to give people ecosystems and infrastructure time to keep up. But equally, if, um, if you are thinking of something like 150 exajoule uh, biofuel scenario by 2050, which was just in the middle of the range, that's much bigger than the, the current or future food component, and 25% of our ag land is degraded, but we have to increase agriculture 60%. And so one of the things that I, I think we really need to focus more on is not just how folks think about mitigation and not just how folks think about adaptation, but think about the intersection of those which really come together when you think about 
uh, food, water, energy, and biodiversity, because a solution to one subset can actually exacerbate other things. And, and then, of course, the sustainable development goals, which try to pull all these things together you know, and integrate environment in, uh, makes this a, a conundrum of metrics and indicators, which I think many of the students in this room will end up helping us figure out. <laughs> Kurosawa-san. Yes, I have a question to Jay. So you uh, noticed the importance of the emission peaking. So, but uh, you did not specify the uh, year required. So by when? Single answer, please. Um, <laughs> for the 1.5 scenarios, it's uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Is 1.5 doable? That's a really good question. And part of it has to do with <laughs> what can you tolerate. Can I just put this question to the room? Raise your hands if you think 1.5, first of all, is technically doable. Keep your hands up if you think it's politically doable. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> do you think it's technically yeah. doable? <laughs> Do you think it's politically doable? Well, our experts, they are the ones who are going to ad advise us if it's technically do doable, and then it's up to us to make it politically doable if it's technically doable. Okay, talk us through your manifesto for a, a 1.5 degree world. How, do you, how will you sell this? How will you sell this to the Norwegian people? What does it look like? Give us your pitch. <laughs> Well, I, mean, I think we all, <laughs> we all, we all have to, I mean, we have to, uh, I mean, cut our manufacturing industry virtually at, uh, down to, to almost zero. Uh, some process uh, emissions we need to have. Our uh, energy production has to be totally renewable. Uh, we have to stop using fossil fuel cars and go out to electric cars. On, in Norway, we have achieved quite much on, on this already. I mean, we, we have to decarbonize all the sectors within our society as, as long as it's technical possible, there will be something left in agriculture, something left in the industry, but except for, for that, we have to, to really to, to electrify all our sectors and, and to make it renewable. So it's a very clear manifesto. Can I ask in the room who would vote for that position? <laughs> it's not looking good for the next elections. <laughs> one, we had one. Hold on, but we got a lot of people. Who here in this room is under the age of 40? Okay, so what's going on here? <laughs> So you're saying the climate, the climate scientists are wrong, or you don't give a damn? How does it work, this? <laughs> which, which is it? Or you think that there's going to be some tech fix that's going to come out of the woodwork and make all of this stuff unnecessary? Is that the... Is that, let's, hear, let's, hear from some, let's hear from some student who cares about this stuff but just voted against, <laughs> against <laughs> the state secretary. Can I hear from a student? Shout out, and we got a mic, we got a mic, okay. We got a mic, thank you. Mm -hmm. I would have voted for you. Okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Hella, I'm a student at NTNU. Um, throughout this whole conference, we've heard about Norway as Sorry, sorry, can I just check, can you, can you specifically, can, can you, did you vote for this proposition? <laughs> no, no, I didn't. No one did, apart from one superstar <laughs> over there. Okay, so why didn't you vote for that? Uh, can, can I just, uh, I, I'm explaining it here, so I'll... It better be good. Better yeah. Be good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Throughout the whole conference, we've heard about Norway as a pioneer country within this energy transition, uh, but we're investing approximately 150 billion Norwegian crowns in oil and gas industry, while only like around about 20 billion Norwegian crowns in renewable energy. I've also read that Norway has increased their CO2 emission by 4% since 1990, while uh, Germany, Denmark, and Sweden has decreased by approximately 20%. Are these numbers wrong, or am I wrong? Uh, <laughs> can someone explain why it is like this, and where is the political action? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, th this has to do with, I mean, almost all these increases from the petroleum sector, it has to do with that Norway has increased our petroleum production very much, at least up to 2000. Now, since 2000, our oil production has been half, but, but still our gas production is, is quite high. And of course, when we increase oil production, because the, the world 
still needs oil and it has needed oil for the last, last 20 years. Norway has produced this oil and gas for the world because there is a demand. If Norway didn't produce this oil and gas, other countries will. And I don't, I don't think that we will solve the, the, the climate problem by I mean, strangling Norwegian oil production. What we have to do is to stimulate the renewable energy so that in the end, or not, so, so, uh, in not too long, people, the world will demand renewable energy at an affordable price instead of oil and gas. But uh, it, it has to do with the supply side to increase our production on, on uh, renewable energy and not Norway unilaterally to, to stop our oil and gas production. Mark. So I have a question, but I'll just make a comment on behalf of the students. I don't think the tr students trust you. So I'd ask the students to put up their hands. Which students in this, in this room trust the politicians in Norway? Hands up. <laughs> Is there any hands up? I bet you trust them more than you trust British politicians. <laughs> the, the, pro the problem is the young people don't trust the politicians. Hold on, but you're being a bit of a downer here. You're saying you can't trust academics, you can't trust politicians. Sorry to say that. <laughs> who you trust? Mark, who do you trust? Uh, my wife and God. <laughs> In that order. <laughs> Uh, I have a question for the panel. So you, you talk about, the, so Jay, you talked about the, I'm, I'm not a climate modeler, obviously, but you talk about that these pathways will go through these points, etc. Are you sure? I mean, these are all models again. I mean, I come back to this point. We have models upon models upon models upon models. We've no exper where experimental evidence is historically is there, but these are incredibly complicated models. I would assume these models are more complex than economic models, are they? Hold yeah. on, Mark, just to clarify the question, you're saying the models that show... I want to know, this panel is telling, everyone is telling us we should do X, Y, Z, A, B, C, Paris, whatever, to do this 1.5, yeah? I'm asking the question, how sure are you? What's your bounds of error here? Okay. Like, you know, I mean, these are models, you know, we could go to all this bother, do everything we're told, and it might only hit 1.1, 1 .1 or, you know, I don't know, I mean, what are the error <laughs> bounds be of this? Does anyone know? <laughs> Jay. I mean, I'm an investor. I want to know what the risks well, are. Okay, Jay, you know. so I'm afraid that's on your back. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I think you're, you're right to ask that, you know, that question, that, that, you know, what's the basis that we have for our knowledge? And, in fact, in that first presentation, I actually stepped back from the sort of simple, do you hit one and a half, you know, do you hit two degrees or not, and I actually framed it up as a probabilistic risk management problem. And I think that's probably a better frame in which to, 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 to view it. Uh, I'm being pushed to be simpler rather than more <laughs> nuanced here. So, but I think we do need to be more nuanced, and I think we do need to frame this up as a risk management problem. And so when I say all, the, you know, all of these pathways go through one of those three nodes, um, it's probably possible for us to assume enough of a miracle, although that's going to require the assumption of some things that we don't currently know how to do. But, you know, we could make those assumptions. But I, I heard earlier someone telling us that we shouldn't be making those sort of miraculous assumptions. But, but we could. And, and then, you, you know, you can basically get the whole system down, down to zero. And, and, and you have to remember that until you get carbon emissions down to zero, the cumulative keeps rising. And that's because of the nature of the carbon cycle. The, the, basically, the ability of oceans to take up, and you, know, you add carbon that's been removed for tens of millions of years, and you put it back into the ocean atmosphere system, you know, Mother Nature is going to put some of it into the oceans, probably the bulk of it. Um, and, but some of it's left there in the atmosphere. And so unless you get that emission, unless you stop adding to that total, you're always adding to the atmosphere. And, and so that's the test. You've got to get everything down to zero. And then you can, you know, this is, you know, we can do this on a spreadsheet. We can back out, you know, at what point did you need to get to zero given that you want a likelihood of, and then we name, you know, 50%. 80%, 10%, that you'll be able to be at one and a half degrees at some future point in time. His body language is still a little bit skeptical. <laughs> Hold on, I, I just want to, before we get in, I do want to get the perspective of the oil and gas industry as well, especially on this question of, you know, 
is 1.5 degree warming, is it doable with an oil industry that still aims to maximize the commercial value of proven oil reserves? So we are no scientist, but we do read into science a lot. And scientific consensus like the IPCC reports and others are very important sort of uh, uh, indicators for us. Um, and many of the member companies of the OTCI, Statel included, publishes its own sort of scenario work to how we interpret the world and all those inputs. Um, so I think what's also very important is to look at sort of commitments and, and willingness of the industry. We don't have all the answers, but we're very clear that we have a responsibility to carry. What's very important right now is to reduce emissions where you can. Right now, not yesterday, tomorrow, right now. And that's why we're sort of upping our efforts on that. Very, very important. So you also need to go after the barrels that require less carbon. We're going towards a low carbon future, um, and that's what we are committed to. So, so there needs to be a sort of a clear um, direction uh, within the companies of the oil and gas industry. What I would like to say, though, is there's something fabulous that's happened over the last sort of few COPs, if I may say. So COP21 was kind of the, one of the first um, multilateral en environments where there was an understanding that it's not just governments that are going to deliver on this agenda. All of a sudden, business and cities were genuinely brought into the fore. This is fabulous because governments can't deliver on this alone. It's far too complex. Everybody needs to play their role. Very, very important, including the consumer side and the importance also of engaging civil society in this. But what was really, uh, I think, monumental in, in COP22 was the involvement of business and also the appreciation of, of private sector has to be heard and included in this because they, if they have no space around the table, how can they deliver on this conundrum that we've been discussing all day here today? We don't have the answers, but what you do is you, if you recognize the other players, then you unleash this sort of ingenuity that the world has. And I find it so, so exciting because right now, What's happening is innovation across sectors, oil and gas sectors, working with cities, uh, with auto manufacturers, working with NGOs to understand where we're going, what we need to do. We need new solutions. Old solutions won't work. So I actually trust that we can deliver on 1.5, possibly. I, I really hope so. Uh, but let's say this, I trust that we deliver on the right direction. And then this innovation will somehow save us, as you, you asked before, Leo. Um, I think it's possible. And the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, what's the quantum, what's the sum that you're putting behind this transition? So, um, on behalf of the alliance that I'm representing here today, so we put up a billion dollars over the next 10 years. And you might say, well, a billion dollars, that's not very much. But actually, what we're trying to do here is to, to set in motion something new. So this is about matching government funding for something they wanted to do for a long time, or we wanted to do a long time, but wanted to bring governments in, or other investors. We're going to pull together with other similar alliances um, to do something that hasn't happened before. It's about levering our, our capital, but also the really exciting point is about the deployment effect that we can have, because the customers of these technologies we're going to invest in are right here inside the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. So we can deploy it immediately try it out, bring the costs down so the rest of the industry can then deploy and use that technology. Thank you. Rosina, you had a thought, and then we got a few questions. <laughs> well, I, I mean, now I have another thought. I, I, I love the idea <laughs> of the public-private partnership because, of course, the amount of money that's needed will absolutely require the private funding, and the public can't do it by themselves. And I think the energy that you cited and the recent COPs is just amazing. I mean, you had everybody, as you said, from businesses to universities <laughs> stepping up and saying we care about it. I, I was going to respond to the uncertainty in the models in a different way uh, back on that question, which was, uh, Adapting to two degrees is no picnic. You know, we expect <laughs> that 20 to 30 percent of the species will be gone. We expect the coral reefs will be gone. And so, you know, I hope we get to 1.5. I hope we get to 1.1. So there are errors on both sides of this that need to be considered. But that we now have 25,000 data sets of more than a decade in duration that are saying that these species are shifting and asynchronies are happening. And we know there will be bad impacts at two degrees. Gosh. 
I had a question on policy and its relevance for financial flows. So uh, the question is, how can certainty for investors be uh, enhanced through policy? And is the policy mix that you currently see on the table, is that helpful? Or are there certain things that are missing or that are systematically uh, not emphasized enough? Mm. I mean, if it was we as politicians, what we can do is, of course, to have a coherent long-term policy that we don't change our policy all the time. That is why I think it's important. And in, at least in Norwegian politics, we have had broad-based agreement within the parliament, within virtually all parties in parliament has made compromises on climate policy to have a long-term po policy. So, so it's the, the climate policy doesn't change 100% from one election to another. We have a broad-based consensus through broad um, agreements within parliament to follow a certain path uh, towards combating climate change. And I think that is especially important for investors to have, to have uh, I mean, what, what, what investors and business uh, uh, mostly are, are what they fear most is instability and, and certain changes, but to have, to have stability and a coherent policy, I think is important for investors and the business community. Rosina, your perspective from the um, OGCI, what does uh, an innovative, far-looking government, what do they do to help accelerate the low carbon transition? What would you want? So, it was about I think we're looking back to May, June 2015. The CEOs sort of pulled together and made a public call for, for, to governments and wrote to heads of state, put open letters in the Financial Times, etc., and said, please give us an effective agreement at COP21 in Paris. And we got one. That, that's the feeling we have. Um, it gives us enough direction to know where the world, what the world wants or where the world wants to go. Now, the how is, of course, the issue. Um, and I think we've heard today that regional approaches are very important. We also heard about the effort sharing across the EU. Every country is not equal. Um, I think what's quite interesting in the setup of the OGCI, we represent the national oil companies as well as international oil companies. And we always have a big domestic presence wherever we are. And we will be able to work on those NDCs in those countries, um, I think as they are being defined as well, I think there's still a lot of leeway on exactly how they're going to be interpreted. So, clear targets, carbon price? So, uh, I think companies have a different view on, on, on carbon price, but um, if I swap hats for a second, in Statel, we're very much in support of a, a carbon price. I, I think we've been subject to a, a price on carbon here in, in Norway since the early 90s. It's, is fed us very well. Uh, we have a very good portfolio of oil and gas assets at, at, um, at, at one of the most carbon efficient oil and gas producers in the world today, thanks to that. So we know it works. We advocate for it around the world. Um, and it's very encouraging to see now. I think I saw Singapore is now introducing a floor price in a couple of years. We've got Canada. There's a lot of interesting developments there. Are we going to see a global price? Probably not. But you know, something's happening, and that's good for business, I think. And some of the Bank of England analysis underpinning Carsten's work, suggesting that between 30 to 70 percent of proven reserves are just unburnable if we want to avoid two degrees, let alone 1.5, an analysis which would cause a fundamental revaluation of the OGCI members. Do you think that analysis is just, is just wrong? So. Maybe this is slightly a slightly separate discussion, but um, what I think with OGCI, I can't really talk about it because there's a lot of national oil companies in the OGCI. So there's a different valuations. They're not listed on the stock exchange, many of them. But on the sort of stranded assets issue, uh, investors today do engage in this topic already. There are a lot of stranded assets in oil and gas. Anyway, you don't, you don't uh, put everything operation that you know of. Um, but it's about low cost and low carbon in the future. And that's also the, the, the strategy that we put forward in Statoil. That's, that's the future we believe in. Thank you. We had, we had, can I have one student question here, please? Yes, and then we'll go to the, go to the panel, please. Hi. 
I'm Lena Reichenberg from Chalmers University in, in Gothenburg. Um, I wanted to ask you because there's been a lot of critici criticism towards the Paris meeting and the outcome not being radical enough, but you all seem to be very happy about the NLDC, so I wanted to ask you, is anyone here from the expert panel or any of you um, critical towards the Paris Agreement? Nice question. Okay, so let me, let me reframe, uh, can I reframe this one? So, um, if you had to choose one word, this is to the expert panel, if you had to choose one word, actually, and to this panel, to describe Paris, and your choice was limited to, it was a miracle, or it was a disaster. Oh. <laughs> no compromises, no fudges, one of those two words. Raise your hand if you think it was a miracle. <laughs> Raise your hand if you think it was a disaster. Okay, so maybe this is your excellent question behind it. So the, the British journalist, George Monbiot, um, he said, well, it was a miracle compared to what it could have been. It was a disaster compared to what it should have been. Um, so let's hear, let's, hear from, let's hear from some of the expert panelists here. Are we patting ourselves on the back? Are we crying with triumph uh, a little bit ahead of time? Thoughts from the panel, please, Christopher. I think the, uh, the thing that you can say hardest against Paris is that it kicks the can down the road uh, quite a bit um, due to the structure of the, ND of the INDCs to NDCs to stock take to, you know, and, and so on. Um, a lot of the INDCs are conditional, a lot of them are intensity based, and uh, there's, there's no compliance mechanism, I mean, frankly. So that's always been the, the case with international climate policy, and that's that's the nature of international policy in, in general. There's like there's very little sticks to, to, to work with. So that would be the that would be the most negative thing I could say about it. I still sit firmly on the miracle side though. <laughs> Any other thoughts, comments? Please, we have Mark we have Mark and then we have a, a, a comment at the back and then we'll go to John, please. So I think it's very important to understand that, you know, I'll just speak for myself only. I, I know very little about this. I mean, I'm an electrical engineer, you know, I'm not a climate scientist, I'm not a, you know, I have a very specialist skill, so, you know, a lot of, I, I'm a, you know, I'm a barroom expert in this. You know, I know, I know very, just people around here know an awful lot more about, I was actually in Paris that time with my wife. We were on holiday, so we weren't at the meeting. <laughs> so, you know, we, I'm genuine. I mean, if you look at the IPCC and things like that, this requires a whole lot of expertise of different people. I mean, I am not an, I was on the IPCC renewables report, but I'm just, I know my piece well. I'm not going to preach to anyone on the other pieces. I rely on my colleagues to do that. So your question actually is, you need to ask a group of people together, you know, their own perspective. You know, everyone's got their own. So my view is I have no idea. I couldn't answer the question, not logically. To tend to feel so, but Paris is the most beautiful city in the world, I'll say that for one. <laughs> we had, okay, there, we had a quick question there, and then we want to go ahead to the panel, please. Shout out. If yeah, you hello. Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Sharik. I'm uh, doing a PhD at NTNU. I come from India. There was a lot of talk about India today. And, uh, yeah, I totally understand and take the point that I think India was not thinking about, CC, about CO2 capture few years back, but I believe right now people are speaking about it, at least from the universities which I come from. I think people are do speaking about it. Now coming to the second point, uh, I have no question to ask, but then there was one comment that I had to, uh, I just want to add one more point, and that is we are speaking about energy, and we are speaking about CCS, whether it should be politically driven, academically driven. I think there's one more thing that we need to add on. I think every person on this planet need to drive this reducing the CO2 emissions and it's just not down to academics or, po or politicians. Uh, I, I mean, there are other concepts also which I don't know we should not spoken about. For example, there is something called sharing economy, which, is, which, is very, which comes very close to optimal usage of resources and optimal usage of the available energy uh, with people. So I believe thrust on these concepts is also important apart from, apart from you know, driving uh, the energy economy. Thank you. Research wise, yeah, thank, thank you, Shadi. Great comments. We're so running out of time, and we've got three questions. Could I ask you, each um, of the three of you, and, and, and Carol in there, if you call out your question, and then we'll take those three as a sort of group soup of questions, and I'll ask, then we'll find out some sort of way to respond. Please. Yeah, th uh, thank you, John Cooper. Uh, 
So Paris provides a great start in creating a global structure. It is an attempt and it's a major step towards a global solution. But I think most businesses that are large energy players would tell you that we've got to find a way to get to a meaningful carbon price that operates more in a global manner. Now, the Paris Agreement has got an article, I think it's Article 6, that actually provides for globalization and linking carbon markets. And what that can mean operationally is, you know, for every billion that Europe has got to spend on decarbonization, it could spend it in Europe and do a few million tons, or it could spend it in Europe, in, in China or India, and do many times that, because they are lower down the cost curve. Great point. And that's the kind of thing that we need to go after, and it's a huge political challenge. But Paris is a great starting point. So, you know, is there, you know, is there a way that you know, the panel sees to take it a stage further? How do we get closer to a proper global carbon market for solutions? Okay, great point. Let's hold that. Let's have, please, Nils, your point, and then Caroline. Well, there you go. Right. Um, well, I really like the questions from the students here. You know, they're refreshing. And this goes to the state secretary, really, and slightly provocative. And that is, uh, what's the plan for Norway? You know, I just wondered, because we have the knowledge. We've got a lot of reports about what we need to do. Uh, we have signed up to, in the parliament, for emission targets in, uh, with EU, with Paris. And we've got three sectors uh, which is dominating this. This is transport, it's petroleum, and industry. But what's the plan to go from the knowledge we've got now and the uh, fulfillment of the uh, agreements we have made, you know. Up to now, we have increased our emissions by 4% on real emissions. Excellent. And we'll ask you to cover that, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> so I agree with John that um, it, it would be uh, a huge step forward to be able to spread carbon pricing around the world. Um, and in the meantime, given the sort of sense of pessimism uh, in the room about getting there, what are we left with? Um, you know, the strategies we're left with are, uh, you know, for rich countries uh, like Norway and Europe, innovative countries to put fossil fuels out of the market, to outcompete them, and that uh, means bringing down the cost of alternatives. It's not cost effective. For sure, <laughs> and it's harder to do because you don't have the carbon price there to help uh, incentivize people to do it. But that's kind of what you're you're left with if you don't have uh, Jay's everyone on board uh, with carbon pricing. The way to get people to decarbonize involuntarily is to make it in their interest. Caroline, thank you. And I think this leaves as a f final input, State Secretary. We're going to ask you to do a new manifesto this time mm -hmm. that kind of focuses in on the carbon price, I think. Yeah. Uh, Just will you sell the carbon price to this group? Well, uh, that's right. We have made the commitments, and it's the first time actually Norway had made such a binding commitment that we will actually be punished by EU. We have to pay extra fines if we don't meet, meet our commitments. So this is a really legally binding commitments, and now we have to deliver on them. That's why we put down this uh, Green Competitiveness Commission that I was referring to. And they made their suggestions to, to, to the government last fall, and we are going to follow that up with a strategy. What the, what the competitiveness report, uh, Green Competitiveness report, point to is, of course, efficient pricing of, of carbon uh, emissions is to use the public purchasing power to, to stimulate innovation in, in climate-friendly technologies, is investments in, in climate-friendly infrastructures, train, uh, uh, renewable energy, and, and, and so on. Uh, and, and also we are using a lot, quite much, to invest in climate, to support industry in investing in climate-friendly technologies, because the ETC price is not high enough to stimulate that, so we also give uh, give some risk, take some of the risk for industries to investing in new technologies through ENOVA, which is based here in Trondheim. That is at least in short what, what our strategy, what our suggestions for the strategy, and, and the government will present our uh, strategy later this year based on the green competitiveness report. And how much is it going to cost someone their energy bill, their fuel transport bill? A lot. I cannot uh, tell. I mean, we, we have to meet our commitments, but no, it's no doubt that it's going to cost. But that is why we have green competitiveness, because at the one, one hand, we have to reduce our emissions sufficiently, but at the same t time, we have to keep up our competitiveness uh, and, our, and our welfare in the society. But it's possible to combine. That is what the re this report showed us. And it's a future where there's jobs. 
It's a future where it will be different jobs. It will be jobs in, in more green technologies, uh, but it will definitely be jobs, even if not all of them will be as highly paid as in the petroleum sector has been up to now. Okay, folks, that's what's on offer. Who would vote for that? <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. That's almost 15 to 20 percent. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are completely out of time, but will you please join me in thanking these fantastic set of panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.